Now, let's be clear. We've all learned about charge, electric charge, and electric force in the fourth grade, and in junior high, and some of us in high school, if you didn't avoid it. Um, but I'm going to teach it a little bit differently, I hope, than what you learned in fourth grade. Um, if I take a rubber rod, and I rub that rubber rod with simulated cat fur, there's no cats harmed, okay? I say that I charge the rod. And what I find is that if I take a second rubber rod and do the same thing to it, that I end up with magic. They repel each other. Now, if I instead take a glass rod and rub that with simulated silk, no silkworms were harmed, what I find is that uh, that attracts the rubber rod. Okay? It's not that different from magic. Okay. A little more. Think of me as Flitwick. Okay, what do you think we're going to get when we do a glass rod and a glass rod? Okay, so I take a second glass rod. I charge it the same way that I did the first glass rod, and I get a repulsion. Okay, now, my guess is that that's the way you were taught in the fourth grade. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little different. We're going to define a third category, uh, the wood category. Now, if I take a piece of wood, and you charge wood not by rubbing it, but by doing that. <laughs> What am I going to get between the charged wooden rod and the charged rubber rod? Tell your neighbor. Okay, let's find out. That's not what you said. <laughs> Okay. Now, if this attracts the rubber rod, what's it going to do with the glass rod? Attract it. Okay, let's see. <coughs> Got to charge this one. Now, what the heck? 
We notice that the wood category acts differently. Uh, I can't find a repulsion with wood. And so we give names to these categories. We call the rubber and the glass charged, and we call the wood category neutral. Okay? Now, Brother Benjamin Franklin, he, uh, he went so far as to take these two flavors of charge, the, the type on the rubber rod and the type on the glass rod, and give them names. And because there were two, he gave them the names negative and positive. Not like we haven't had enough to do with negative and positive in 205. Now, the reason he chose those names is because Benjamin thought that there was an invisible substance, this essence, that caused charge. And that when you rub the rubber rod with the simulated cat fur, I'm guessing he didn't have simulated cat fur, but no matter. Anyway, when you rub that rubber rod with the cat fur, yes, yeah, don't miss it. Uh, um, he thought that some of the essence left the rubber rod. And that when you rub the glass rod, some of that invisible essence entered the glass rod. And that's why the negative rubber rod, it was, it was missing some of this essence. And the glass rod was positive because it had extras of this essence. Now it turns out that there is an essence. And Benjamin had a 50-50 chance of getting this right. And we've been paying for his mistake or his unluckiness ever since. I'll explain that in just a moment. But before I go there, what about magnets? What about magnets? I have here a bar magnet, and it's got a red end and a blue end. We call the red end the North Pole and the blue end the South Pole. And we see that two red poles or two north poles repel. We also see that two blue poles repel. And we see that a red pole attracts a blue pole, and vice versa, okay? Now, my question is, uh, if everything in the, on the planet can be put into one of these three categories, it's either more like the rubber, more like the glass, or more like the wood. Is a bar magnet like a rubber rod, be the glass rod? the wood rod, D, F, rubber, F, glass. With your clicker, please, tell me what you believe. Charge it up, 
it attracts the blue end and it attracts the red end. And if I take a wooden rod, do silliness, I get nothing. Okay? So, which category? Wood. Wood. Ooh, that seems that seems different. Because with the wood, I never got a repulsion. Well, it turns out that North Pole will repel a North Pole and South Pole will repel a South Pole. And that's similar in some respects on the surface to what we're seeing electrically, but it's a very, very different phenomenon. Electrically, this bar magnet is neutral. It's, it's neutral. Okay, it acts like the wood. It attracts things that are charged. It doesn't attract things that are neutral. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll talk about that later uh, some more. Folks, before we go on, I just want to talk to you few, the ones who are, have the most beautiful souls. Okay? Those are the ones that are going to become science teachers. Okay? High school science teachers. There's no, no more higher calling. Anyway, these demos that I just performed uh, for years and years were the scariest demos that I ever did. These were much scarier to me than the bed of nails, the bed of death, the hammer of death, <coughs> the wheel of death. Okay? And the reason being is because I was doing these demos in Seattle. Now it turns out that when you charge a rod, uh, that charge wants to leak out into the atmosphere and if there's humidity in the air, it will leak out quickly. So when I was doing these demos in Seattle, I had about two seconds to do the demo after I charged the rod, or I was dead meat, and I was terrified. In this beautiful place we call Montana, you can charge that, that thing up there, and tomorrow it'll be charged. I mean, it's just so dry here, it's nice. Now. If you look at these rods, and you'll be using rods in the next tutorial, uh, you'll notice that one side of them is all scuffed up, roughed up. And down at the bottom, Jerry has written, hold this end. Now that's because he's a professional. What he wanted to write was, hold this end, stupid. Uh, but he, he just wrote, hold this end. And that's because our hands contain oils. And as soon as you touch the the part of the rod that you're going to charge with your hand, game over. Okay. Once those oils have gotten onto this rod, you cannot charge it. And so if you get into the lab next week, or this week for people that are doing it on Mondays, if you get into that lab and try to charge a rod and you, you, you're not getting any results, you want to take the rod right to the corner of the room where there's a sink, get soap, it's got to be soap and water, not just water, and get those oils off of the, the rod. Now folks, if you're going to be a teacher and you get up and you find out that nothing is working, that your students are giggling at you for the wrong reason, just excuse yourself, go to the bathroom, wash the rods and come back. Okay? That was free of charge. I did not charge you tuition for that advice. Okay. Now, you've all been taught the standard model in which neutral objects are made up of a bunch of atoms, those atoms are both positively charged and negatively charged. The positive charge is in the protons that are contained in the nucleus of the atom, and the negative charge is in the electrons that swim outside. Again, you've been told that the positive charge, the protons, are 1,800 times more massive than the electrons. So that's where all the mass of the rod, the the rubber rod is, okay? Now, charge comes in two flavors, positive and negative, normally balanced or neutral, and that it turns out is because this electrical force that we'll talk about is so strong that when there's something that's not neutral, it tends to try to get neutral by exerting forces on things, 
And uh, so, again, we'll see that in the next couple of days. The amount of positive charge in an object is fixed. If I want to change the number of protons in this rubber rod, I need a hacksaw. I need to cut off part of it. Because those molecules or atoms that make up this rod are in a lattice work. And the, the nucleus is, is part of that lattice work. It's not going anywhere. The imbalance is by taking away electrons or adding electrons. And that we call the charge. Now graphically it looks like this. A neutral object would have just as many protons as electrons. If I charge something by adding electrons, does it become positive or negative? negative. Becomes negative. Now here's where Uncle Ben got it wrong. Not Uncle Ken, Uncle Ben. He felt that the negative rubber rod was negative because some of the magic essence was leaving. But indeed, if that invisible magic essence is electrons, when you rub the rod, does it, does it lose electrons? No, it gains electrons, okay? The thing that loses the electrons is the uh, simulated cat fur, okay? And this becomes positive. So it was going, this invisible substance was going exactly the opposite direction that Ben uh, inferred or <coughs> assumed. And as a result, we get some minus signs in our physics that's unfortunate. We're going to find when we get to electric circuits that we're essentially uh, make, playing make-believe just to get rid of some of these mistakes that Uncle Ben hoisted upon us. Okay. Now, if instead, we say that's negatively charged, if instead we start with a neutral object and we remove electrons. Uh, in that case, we leave bare protons, naked protons behind, and that gives us a net positive charge. Now, the question is, how many electrons do we typically remove when we rub a, uh, a rubber rod like that? Well, typically it's on the order of a hundred million. Now, any of you that have been following the, uh, the newspapers, uh, the Powerball is about 400 million, so that gives you a, kind of a scale of how many electrons we're removing when we, uh, when we rub that glass rod there, okay? If you equate each dollar with an electron, you're rich, you're rich, okay? Now, quick question that seems kind of apropos of nothing. A bushel basket contains 50 apples. I come to school with one apple in my lunch. How many bushels of apple do I have? I have one apple. One fiftieth of a bushel. One fiftieth of a bushel. Hold that thought. It turns out that when we're measuring charge, we use a unit called the Coulomb. Now the Coulomb is a huge amount of charge. If we had one coulomb of charge in this room, it would destroy the city of Bozeman. There would be lightning and thunder and just mass destruction, cats and dogs living together, are we again? Okay. Now, why did we choose a unit that was so unattainable and so unusable? Well, historically, we chose the unit of one ampere first. One ampere is the amount of current that flows through the wires in a standard household appliance in your kitchen. It's a, it's a perfectly reasonable unit for the flow of, of charge. Now, it turns out that that unit was chosen first, and it was chosen to be useful. But because of that choice, we get stuck with the choice of one Coulomb being this huge amount of charge. Indeed, it's the amount of charge you would have if you had 6.25 times 10 to the 18th naked protons sitting in a pile in the middle of the room. 6.25 times 10 
to the 18 protons. Now folks, I go back to the apples. If 50 apples is one bushel, and you only have one apple, how many bushels do you have? One fiftieth. So I would ask, you've got one naked proton, one proton, you brought it for lunch. How many coulombs do you have? How are you going to find that number? Yes, you take that number and you say the charge on one proton is equal to 1 over 6.25 times 10 to the 18 coulombs. Now, if you plug that into your calculator, what you end up with is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And we call that the elementary charge. Now, unfortunately, the word elementary starts with the letter E. And so beginning students tend to think of that as the electron charge. That is not the electron charge. That is the elementary charge on one single naked proton. Okay? We typically, we notate uh, charges with a Q. And the charge of a proton is E, or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, the charge on an electron is minus E, or minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Okay? So again, I hope this is review for everyone. Now, um, let's just see how big a fraction this is. So we define the charge on one proton to be that elementary charge, and the charge of an electron is minus E. Redundancy there. Here's my, my question. If a penny contains about 2 times 10 to the 23rd protons and an equal number of electrons, if we were to somehow charge that penny up to one coulomb, and it would be foolish to do so, it would destroy Bozeman, but what the heck? In the name of science, we do it. What fraction of the electrons have been added or removed from the penny? First of all, were they added or removed? They're removed, okay? And the fraction is going to be the number that we remove divided by the original number that we have. Now the original number is given in the problem, 2 times 10 to the 23rd. If I want to make 1 coulomb of charge, net charge, I have to remove 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons, leaving that many naked protons behind. Now if I do that division, I get 3 one thousandths of 1%, a tiny, tiny fraction of the electrons that were contained in that penny. And that's to get it to one coulomb. Typically, we charge things to microcoulombs, which is 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, or nanocoulombs, which is 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Okay? We never really charge something up to a coulomb, because we're not stupid. Okay? Don't want it. This now, we've all dealt with conductors and insulators. We know that conductors are things like metal, okay, all kinds of metal. We also throw graphite into this category, but it's not really a, a very good conductor. Um, in those conductors, the valence electrons, the electrons in the outermost shell, are, are free to kind of wander. They can go through this lattice work from, uh, from their atom to neighboring atoms. And uh, they're free as long as they stay within the metal. In a, 
insulator, the electrons are tightly bound to their particular atom. And so they can't flow wherever they're comfortable. Now, we have found, we have found that neutral objects, objects that act like the wood, are attracted to charged objects. <coughs> Let's see if we can understand that. I have here a neutral can. Folks, how do I know that this can is neutral? Well, I didn't. When it was sitting on the table, I had no idea whether it was neutral or charged. But as soon as I grabbed it, it was neutral. Why? Because there's two things about Greg that you need to know. First of all, Greg is a conductor. Electrons are free to flow on the Greg. And second of all, if this thing had, say, extra electrons, if it were charged negatively, those electrons would want to get away from each other as far away as possible. And when they have the opportunity to go on to the Greg, I got to tell you, that gets them far, far away from each other because the Greg is so much bigger than the can. So if this wasn't neutral, it was neutral when I picked it up. The same thing with this bar magnet. It is possible to charge up a bar magnet, positive or negative. It doesn't happen very often because every now and again someone picks it up. And as soon as someone picks it up, it's neutral. It's neutral because it's a metal, it's a conductor, and if it had extra electrons, that go on to the person. Okay. Now, in the laboratory, we tend to neutralize things by touching them to a, a water pipe that goes down into the, into the earth. And it turns out the earth is a great big conductor, and then those charges can spread out on the surface of the earth. Okay. Now, let's go back. I need my neutral can. I take that can. I take the charge rod and I do magic. Now, if we don't want to deal with three flavors of charge, if we only want there to be two flavors of charge, we need to explain that attraction. So if I represent that can, that neutral can, as a bunch of protons and electrons, if it's, neutral, if it's neutral, I should have just as many electrons as protons. Now, if I bring in my uh, ebonite rod, ebonite is just a sophisticated word for rubber rod, okay? That ebonite rod is negative. It's got too many electrons. Now, what's that going to do to the positive charges? Where are they going to move, these positive charges? Towards the rod. Trick question. <clears throat> They don't, move. they don't move. The positive charges are in the nucleus, the big massive nucleus that's locked into the lattice of the can. They don't go anywhere. It's the electrons that move. Okay? And how would they move? Yeah, they're repelled by that rubber rod, so they go over there. Now, I see a problem. Do you see the problem? Have you ever in your life gone into a crowded elevator and found everyone in one corner? <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. Okay? These negative electrons are repelled from these negative charges in the rubber rod. But they're also repelled from each other. They're not going to be stacked on top of each other like that. So what really happens is it starts out with a uniform distribution. I bring that rubber rod in and the electrons just take a little baby step away. Not a huge step, just a little baby step. But what that does is it leaves a region of the can without any electrons. Okay? Or more naked protons than protons that have uh, more positive charge than negative, shall we say. It also leaves part of that can more negative than positive. Now, that positive side of the can is going to be attracted to the rubber rod. The negative side is going to be repelled. 
If I have just as much excess positive here as I've got excess negative there, why wouldn't these two forces be the same size and cancel each other out? Brave soul, raise your hand. Where are you? Why don't they cancel each other out? Distance. Distance. This force is incredibly dependent on how close the charges are. It turns out that when the charges are, are compact, able to be represented by small volumes, this force goes off as 1 over r squared. That means twice as far away as one-fourth as strong. Uh, three times as far away, one-ninth as strong. So that means because these negative charges are being repelled, but they're so much further away than these positive charges, that repulsion is going to be weaker and when I add the two forces together, I get a net attraction. Now, what if I had used a glass rod instead? Well, you know what the answer is. I still get an attraction. But now, since it's the electrons that move, the electrons must be moving the opposite way that they were with the rubber rod. <coughs> but still, the side that's closest to the rod is the attractive force and it dominates. You always get an attraction when you're dealing with a neutral object. Always. Okay? You never find a repulsion. Questions? Okay. Now, we've talked about conductors, but we also saw that a charged object could attract a, an insulator like wood. And indeed, if I take this balloon and I, I charge it up, it's like a charged rubber rod. If I bring it close to this door, what I find is that I get an attraction. Watch. Not so much. Man. Yeah. Come on. Get for it. <laughs> Okay, so clearly it doesn't work on fake hair, but... <laughs> now, let's understand this attractive force that you've used to decorate for parties. Um, in wood, like many insulators, the molecule has a dipole built in. What I mean by that is that one part of the molecule is more positive than negative, one part is more negative than positive. And in general, when you're just looking at a piece of wood, those are randomly oriented so that the wood is neutral. When I bring that, that charged balloon, well, that's like a rubber rod, um, the electrons are not free to leave their molecule. They're stuck. But the molecules can be jiggled. And the closer I bring that rubber <coughs> rod, the more jiggling that occurs, okay? Now, if I look at the surface, right here I find a layer of positive charge. I will find on the other side of the door a layer of negative charge. It's like I bring this rubber rod, let's say that you are molecules of wood, and each of you is polarized so that your head is positive because it thinks and your feet are negative because they stink. Okay? Is that a visual? Now when I bring this negative rod to this side of the wooden door, you're all going to want to rotate. You're going to want to lean in your chair. Now which way is your head going to lean? Towards the negative rod or away? Towards. And that means your feet are going to lean, lean away. Now if I look at you, lean you guys, lean, lean, lean. If I look in here, his feet are right about the same place as her head, likewise here, and so it's neutral in there. But along the side, I've got a bunch of heads hanging out, a bunch of positive charge. On the other side, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, I've got a bunch of feet sticking out, stinky feet. So I've got a layer of negative charge on that side, layer of positive charge on this side, because that side's so far away, this side dominates, and we get an attraction again that holds that balloon up. Now that's exactly what allows me to do this demo, the simulated cat fur. 
I have a piece of lumber that is balanced on a watch uh, glass. And as you can see, I can, I can perform large magic tricks. <laughs> Okay, what I've done is just caused a, a surface charge to be formed on the side of the lumber that's closest to uh, the rubber rock. Okay. And that causes the net attraction. Now what we get is an attraction between neutral objects and charged objects. In both cases, it's caused by a charge separation. But in a conductor, the electrons actually flow to create that separation. In an insulator, they just shift. They just, uh, the dipole rotates, and we end up with a surface charge separation. Oh, I hope you're bored. I hope you've been here before. Okay? Now, check question really quick with your clicker. If you remove one electron from a quarter and one electron from a Buick, Buick is an old car that we used to have, which if either has a greater net charge, is it the quarter, the Buick, or neither? With your clicker, people. The answer is C, neither. Both the quarter and the Buick started out with just as many electrons as protons, neutral. When you took one electron from each, you left one naked proton on each. That naked proton was the net charge, an elementary charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Both objects had exactly the same net charge. Charge. Okay. Now, I want you to see that charge is a property of an object. If I have an object, I could say it has a color that I call blue. And this object has a shape that I call round. It has a mass that I measure and I find it's, it's uh, two kilograms. That tells me how hard it is to shape it. And it has a charge that I measure to be minus three micro coulomb, where a micro means 10 to the minus 6. Now it turns out that these characteristics describe the object. And some of those characteristics, like color and shape, do nothing more than describe it, so that you can find it and say, hey, that's my object. But if you look at the mass of the object, we have found that because of that mass of two kilograms, that blue object that's round is attracted to all other objects that have mass. And if those masses are separated by a distance r, that attraction is given by this formula. It's always an attractive force. They're attracting each other just as much as each other because the masses are, are a, a product, and three times four is equal to four times three. So Newton's third law is built right into this formula. Okay, that constant of proportionality, the universal gravitational constant, took a hundred years before Henry Cavendish was able to measure that because it was such a small force between these objects. Now, what if one of the objects is huge and one is small? What if one is a Death Star? And one is just one of those little X-wing thingy thingies. Okay? Are these forces still the same size? Please, say yes. Say yes, Greg, they have to be. By Newton's third law. Okay? Now, 
Just like that blue round object is attracted to other things in the room that have mass because of its mass, it also will be attracted or repelled from other things that have charge. So by virtue of this property that we call charge, I can have a force exerted on it, and it can exert forces on other things. Now, we denote charge with that letter Q, just like we denote mass with M, and so if I had two charges that were a distance R apart, if those charges were both positive, I would get a repulsive force. If they were both negative, I would get a repulsive force. If one is positive and one is negative, I would get an attractive force. Now this constant of proportionality is called Coulomb's constant, and this formula is called Coulomb's law. Coulomb's constant is 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. That number will be on the front page of the second midterm exam. Uh, you don't need to memorize it unless you plan on going to geek parties. But this constant is so big compared to the gravitational constant. This force is so strong compared to the gravitational force that it, it's trivial to measure that, that constant there. Okay? It didn't take a hundred years like it did for the gravitational <coughs> constant. Now, what if Q2 is zero? When you look at that formula, if one object is neutral, has no charge, what does that formula tell you that the force should be? Zero. zero. Is that what we saw with the neutral can? Is that what we saw with the neutral wood? No or heck no? Heck no. Now, it turns out that Coulomb's law is very, very much like the sledgehammer in my toolbox. It was the tool that I thought solved every problem <laughs> until my radiator was broke. Okay, it turns out that a sledgehammer is not a good tool to fix a radiator. Now, this law, Coulomb's law, only applies to point charges. When is a charge a point charge? <coughs> well, when this can is about the same size as the distance between the can and the rod, it's not a point charge. But if I were to charge up this can and have it interact with, a ch with another charge in Belgrade, then it would be considered a point charge. When the size of the charge is small, compared to that R, giving the distance between the charges, then you can use this formula. But when the, when the can is large, even though it's got a Q of zero, it can set up a charge separation where one side of the can is positive, one side is negative. The can still has a charge of zero, but because of that separation, I can get a force that's not zero. So only use this formula when you're dealing with charge that's really, really concentrated in a small point. We've run out of time, people. Good luck on the exam tomorrow night. May the net force be with you.